Thanks for joining our Drive Electric Week virtual session, Public Charging Infrastructure, How Much Will Texas Need? Um, I'm Aaron Choate, uh, the president of Austin EV, the local chapter of the Electric Vehicle Association. And I'm joined today by Joseph Barletta, and he'll be giving our talk. Uh, he'll be giving a brief presentation on the topic, and then I'll open the floor to questions. Feel free to put your questions in the chat, um, and I will share them out, or you can unmute and ask them yourselves when we finish the presentation. So, Joseph, go ahead. Awesome. Thank you, Aaron. And again, thanks, everyone, for, uh, you know, uh, attending and, and giving me your time. I'll try to make it brief uh, and kind of open up uh, our session for more uh, questions and answers. But uh, just a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Joseph Barletta. I'm the founder and CEO of Smart Charge America, uh, where we are an all-inclusive uh, electric car charging station installation company. So started in 2007. Uh, we've been doing uh, electric car charging station installations all over the nation. We're uh, headquartered here in Austin, Texas. Uh, we manage all of Austin Energy's uh, public charging infrastructure for those guys. Um, but we also uh, are in uh, 20 cities uh, across the U.S. And so we uh, just basically try to maintain and um, do all things related to e electric car charging. That's both residential, commercial, as well as servicing uh, a lot of these uh, charging stations that are existing in the wild today. So um, you know, we started in 2007, we probably, we've installed over about 10,000 charging stations. A majority of those, I would say, are residential installations, uh, but we've been, uh, over the last, I'd say about five years, been doing a lot more commercial infrastructure um, build-outs. And so, uh, today's session uh, on all things uh, public charging infrastructure and how much do we, we think we need um, is, is very close to our hearts because uh, we're the guys that are kind of boots on the ground out there uh, installing this infrastructure day in and day out. Um, and so I just wanted to basically share uh, some of the information that uh, basically I've been tasked to put together uh, to get in front of the PUC and, and other uh, boards uh, just to basically have it adjusted, uh, kind of have an adjusted look at how we should be putting in this infrastructure and how much of the infrastructure should we would be putting in um, and how much it would cost essentially. So um, uh, without further ado, what I wanted to do as I, as I dive, kind of dive down deep uh, into this is uh, the Alternative Fuels Data Center has an important, um, uh, I guess, tool that they have on their website when it comes to uh, electric vehicle infrastructure projection. Um, and the tool, I basically linked uh, the website uh, and on the chat there, if you guys want to take a look at it, but it's a really cool, um, it's a really cool tool. It, it allows the state, if you're a state, to uh, try to estimate exactly how much public infrastructure you would need based on the amount of the electric vehicles that are currently existing in your state. Uh, and it also does the same exact estimate for uh, any type of city or urban area uh, that you're in. And so really unique tool. Um, I've managed to kind of plug in the numbers on, on both uh, statewide here in Texas and, and city-wise here. Uh, in Austin, and uh, my my projection, my numbers uh, have come in relatively close to uh, with the exact, um, uh, I guess the, the the prediction that the tool the tool has made. So, um, without further ado, what I wanted to do was basically just share with you guys my screen. Uh, I really kept this presentation a little more, I guess, informal um, because I really wanted to open up the dialogue with regards to questions and answers. Uh, that a, little, a lot of you guys might have with regards to that infrastructure. Um, but for the most part, uh, what I wanted to do was just share with you all, I mean, what we know from public infrastructure is that, well, what we know from charging in general uh, is that 90% uh, plus, so just about 90%, a little bit over 90% of all electric car charging um, occurs at home. Now we know, of course, there are exceptions uh, to the rule, we know 30% of our residents here in town, you know, live in multifamily dwellings, so forth and so on. But in general, right now, and as it as it stands, um, we we know that about 90% of all of our charging occurs at home. So with that, you have 10% that actually occurs in public. You can kind of make a fair assessment of that. So uh, with Smart Charge America's angle is we see, okay, well, if 90% of that charging occurs at home and 10% occurs in the public, well, then that means that you need about 10% of the amount of EVs on the road, you need to have 
rather, you know, analogous to the, the public charging stations that are in the ground. So if you have, uh, you know, 100,000 electric vehicles in your city, you need to have at least 10,000 charging stations to be able to support that, uh, you know, that demand uh, for charging. Um, and so that's kind of, you know, this kind of simple rule of 10. I just want us to kind of focus on, on that uh, as we go into uh, the, the, the calculation of all things charging. So without further ado, uh, I want to go ahead and share my screen with you guys. And let's see, I want to make sure everyone sees. Hopefully everyone sees that, thumbs high. Um, basically, the alternative fuels database you'll see, if we estimate for a state, we can go in and we can say, okay, well, um, you know, we'll go to the state of Texas. And I know that I think in 20, by 2023, the state of Texas estimates about 100,000 electric vehicles will be on the road. Uh, so going in there, and then it gives you a possible breakdown on exactly like how many DC fast charging uh, needs to be uh, out there, how many, you know, uh, public level two charging stations, how many uh, with regards to a mix of workplace level two charging stations as well. Um, and so right now, if the state of Texas were to have 100,000 electric vehicles on the market right now, um, the system and the, the AF, uh, AFDC uh, tells us that we should be looking at somewhere around 4,000 level two charging stations and about 326 DC fast charging stations. So actually, you know, not too bad. So, but let's put into perspective uh, the state of Texas and where we're at now. So uh, we know that the state of Texas right now has about 52,000 charging stations. I mean, 52,000 EVs, uh, according to the most recent uh, uh, Department of Transportation data. So if we take that uh, and we go ahead and recalculate, then our state currently right now should have somewhere uh, close to about 2,000 uh, electric uh, vehicle level two public charging stations and about 172 public DC fast charging stations. Um, I can tell you right now, I think we're falling just a bit short of that. Now, I, I can't attest to how much uh, public infrastructure uh, currently exists in each one of our cities, um, uh, but we can pretty sure we're, we're I think we're about maybe 80 to 75 percent there with this projection. So, um, you know, but that's what the tool is there for. It's 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 meant for that. Now, uh, as far as this screen here, um, you guys can see uh, what I did was I just broke it down into the city of Austin from Texas. Uh, I figured, you know, doing doing the an Austin uh, National Drive Electric Week presentation about Dallas or Houston or San Antonio might uh, might be a little skewed. So I just want to focus on Austin, all things Austin. Um, and right now we can Joseph, see that Austin. Yes, go ahead. Could you um, zoom in on that section a bit? I'm concerned people yeah. aren't going to be able to see. Absolutely. Let me make it a little bit. Uh, let me see here. Let's go zoom. Uh, let's go 150. How's that? How's that look? Perfect. Better? Thank you. Perfect. 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 Apologize. Uh, so, uh, you know, right now, as of uh, in, inside the city of Austin, we have about 15,000 EVs. Um, and so remember the 10%, right? We want to take 10% of that. And that's how much public infrastructure we should have currently in place in the ground. Now, um, this is analogous to the amount of ports that we have in the ground. Um, and so right now, 15,000 charging stations public wise in the ground. I think we're, we're pretty close to that. Um, if I'm not mistaken, I know there's about 450 uh, public charging stations that we're in charge of right now uh, for the city of Austin and a majority of those have dual ports um, and are operational so you could probably say we're around a thousand right now and I would say somewhere around a thousand if you want to look at per port um, I could be uh, a little bit off but that's just kind of a fair assessment to see uh, where um, you know kind of where we're at now so based on the amount of EVs we're a little bit short with regards to our public infrastructure and how much actually is needed to be able to meet the charging demand that we have um, now in the state of Texas again, 52,000. Uh, they're saying that my projections are saying that we should be somewhere around 5,200 charging ports all throughout the state. Um, and so, basically, if you look at uh, the closest projections that we got was from Austin uh, in 2023, are projected to be about 52,000 EVs, and so that, that's in the next two years. Um, and so with that. Uh, we're going to have to almost quadruple the amount of ports uh, inside of our projection um, to have exclusive somewhere around 5,200 ports. And so I don't, I don't want you guys to focus on like what we would need. I want to focus on uh, kind of 
the, the just of the asset mix when it comes to public charging infrastructure. Most people, when it comes to public infrastructure, they're thinking level two charging. Um, but it's just been recent that with the onset of networks like Electrify America, the Tesla supercharging network, uh, you know, companies like Blink and EVgo, that we're, we're, we're kind of looking more towards that of DC fast charging infrastructure as well. And so it's important to understand that when we talk about infrastructure, it's a mix. It's an asset mix of both level two and level three. And we don't want to deal with level one. Um, but just focus on level two and DC fast charging for now. So of that 10% mix that we talked about when it comes to the amount of EVs you actually have on the road, of that 10% mix, we know that we probably will be able to, you know, kind of have an asset mix of around 90% um, of level two charging ports and about 10% of that 10% being for DC fast charging. Now, the reason being is that when it comes to electric charging infrastructure, we just, you have to kind of remove that mentality of depot, uh, you know, set up shop uh, only in exclusive amounts, you know, uh, areas, so forth and so on. Electricity is all around us. Uh, and so infrastructure is more along the lines of uh, made wherever that electricity is, is, is available. Uh, and so when it comes to our, our shopping centers, our grocery stores, um, restaurants, we can put charging infrastructure in those places. And so it, it just makes it a little bit easier to put that level two uh, charging infrastructure in place as opposed to the DC fast charging. So of the 10%, we look at an asset mix of about 90% level two and 10% DC fast charger. So I know what you guys are saying, why 10% DC fast charging? I need more charging, you know, need more DC fast. Char I want to see more DC fast charging out in the, in the world. Reason is cost. Uh, if you look down here, what we did was we kind of broke down the site and design cost, um, you know, for, you know, kind of a typical site uh, where the charging stations are at. And so basically for all, all purposes, level two charging station sites, we looked at eight stations per site. Um, and so that's like eight dual port stations. And so that's about 16 total ports in that one site or cluster of charging stations. And then for our DC fast charging site design setup, we figured eight charging station sites. Uh, I guess eight charging stations per uh, per site, uh, and so you know that's kind of the typical mix of uh, all things um, Electrify America. Some of the more recent Austin Energy Station sites, uh, I think they have about four to eight uh, on on those. And so, but for for all intended purposes, we want to focus on eight and eight. The DC fast charger is one port, you know, per station. Uh, I didn't want to focus on two ports, even though you have two ports, you can only use one at a time. You can't use two at the same time. So I just wanted to focus on eight ports, eight charging stations for DC fast charging. Now, the most important part is this 50 kW system here. So DC fast charging of the DC fast charging mix, you have different power levels of DC fast charging. So we call them tiers. So you have tier one, tier two, tier three, tier four. Tier one is usually your 50 kW systems. And so that's more like the, the V-fill systems that you guys see out in the public uh, or the, the uh, charge coin um, DC fast chargers that uh, Austin Energy has recently set up uh, in a majority of spots all over the city. So those are 50 kW stations. That's tier one DC fast charging systems. Those systems usually cost somewhere around $50,000. You can see the actual cost to install, uh, all of that stuff totals a total installation costs about $70,000 to install per port. That's to put that infrastructure into the ground. Um, that's the, the, the charging station, the, the transformers, uh, the switch gears, all the civil work, everything, the electrical wires, all of that to put into the ground. That's how much it costs per port to put that uh, infrastructure in. Now, you can see right here, level two, you're probably looking at an order of magnitude less, somewhere around 6,250. So I could easily say 7,000 and we'd be right on, on, on par. So the most important thing is it's an order of magnitude from putting in a level two charging station port into the ground as opposed to a DC fast charging. And that's why of that asset mix, uh, it's important that right now you would see a lot more charging stations, level two charging stations in the ground because it's substantially lower cost to be able to put that infrastructure in the ground. That's now this is, you know, allegus to 50 kW. So using the same exact, you know, scenario, we want to look at where, um, where will we be if, let's say we're looking at 
150 kW charging stations. And so I know that a lot of you guys uh, have, have driven up and have used 150 kW stations. Um, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, a majority of the Electrify America stations used to be 150 and then they would have like one 350 kW station like on the end. Um, or I think it was the opposite way around. Some of the sites are all 350 kW and then they have a 150 kW on the end that has a Chatamo uh, station. So we can kind of discuss the fundamentals of that breakdown. But for the most part, if we if we look at the same exact scenario and we look at the 150 kW stations, the wire is thicker, um, the transformers uh, have to be larger, all of the uh, charging stations are a little bit more expensive. Uh, and so the cost per installation uh, goes up substantially. Now you can see uh, when it comes to the tier tier two charging stations on the DC fast charging infrastructure at 150, you're looking at about $130,000 per port to put that infrastructure into the ground. That is a lot of money. Now, of course, your level two stays the same at 68, uh, 5. Uh, and so with this, you can see when it comes to higher power charging stations putting into the ground, it is a substantially larger investment per port to be placed in. Now, when it comes to where we like the actual charging infrastructure that we need to be put in the ground, I think it's across the board. Everyone wants to see 350 kW stations in the ground, no matter what. Don't waste your time with 50 kW and 150 kW stations. We want 350. We want more power. We're bigger. We're Texas. Give it to us, baby. Yes. Not always the case here. You can see price per port to put that 350 kW stations into the ground. Again, everything is a little bit more costly. You're looking at $215,000 per port to put that into the ground. So uh, these are you know, kind of the closest projections that we can get. Um, now, we do know that President Biden uh, is rolling out uh, a, uh, a federal uh, infrastructure uh, investment and jobs act. Um, and we have all intense purposes of anticipating somewhere around $408 million that'll be subsidized to the state of Texas for all things public charging infrastructure uh, to help support that movement. So what I did was I just broke it down for the next five years. And so uh, that's what that 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 $408 million was supposed to be allocated towards the next five years towards all things public charging infrastructure. And so if that I, all I did was just break it down 20 percent per year of that 408 million and that gave me uh, 81 million six hundred dollars per year that is being allocated to the state of texas uh, now the important thing is is well what do we do with that money well if you look at the breakdown that we talked about earlier whereas well if we take the, that money and we look at 90 10 percent asset mix um, then essentially we should be able to spend 73 million dollars on all things level two charging stations per year and then $8 million on all things uh, DC fast charging infrastructure per year. Um, and then if we do that, then that will basically say that, hey, you know, in the course of the next five years, we'll have a total of 58,000 level two charging stations and only 583 DC fast charging stations. So when I saw that and I did that work, I was like, that's not right. Um, that's not going to work um, because of course you see the asset mix on the alternative fuels database. It, it, there is substantial, there's like a kind of a ratio that, that you should have. Now, the only difference here is the actual cost. That's why you can't simply just break it down 90, 10. It's because the amount of cost that it, that it takes to put in a DC fast charging station per port, right? As opposed to putting in a level two charging station. So what I did was I went back and we kind of did a little more research and we said, hey, look, of that $81 million that we receive as the state of Texas, we need to maybe put a little bit more money into DC fast charging from that, uh, from that allocation because the extensive cost per port um, you know, of DC fast charging relative to level two charging. So um, I hope, I hope, I'm hope I'm not losing you guys on this, but for the most part, you can see what we did was we just adjusted it and we said, okay, of these total funds, let's put 30% of those funds towards level two charging, and let's put 70% of those funds towards DC fast charging because DC fast charging is so much more expensive, right? Um, or, you know, why didn't we flip it, uh, you know, go 90, 10 the other way? I don't know. I just, we, we, we figured that the 30, 70 would, would result in better, uh, kind of better numbers for us. And so you can see with that, 
the level two charging ports here, we're looking at adding about 3,900 charging ports when it comes to level two infrastructure per year with that with that with those funds. And so that'll get our cities and our states uh, corridors, you know, kind of highway corridors really jam packed with level two charging, which is good. Uh, but at the same time, when it comes to the, the, the tier one, that 50 kW charging station, you're looking at adding 816 of those bad boys per year, uh, which has an asset mix of about 4,000 DC fast charging stations. Uh, if we do all things, 50 kW charging stations statewide, $70,000 cost per port to put those in. This is the allocation that we can actually see where that money would be and how many charging stations would be scattered throughout. So this is the number, the most important number right here, the 4,080. Um, the 19,584 on the level two charging, that kind of stays you know, consistent, um, but the amount of funds uh, driven towards DC fast charging, depending on what tier you actually put into the ground, you're gonna get less charging stations or more charging stations, depending on which one. So 4,080 charging stations, uh, DC fast charging stations out there in the state of Texas over the next five years, if we look at all things 50 kW stations across the board. If we turn and look into the same projections in albeit 150 kW stations, uh, we do that same asset mix in the adjusted funding, you're looking at 2,200, around 2,200 DC fast charging stations. Uh, in the state of Texas, if we're looking at all things considered blanketing the state of Texas with 150 kW DC fast charging uh, infrastructure. And then, of course, if you if you say, look, we should just be looking at all things DC fast charging, 350 kW, make no exceptions, spare no expense. Uh, we need to be looking towards the future, scalability, future proof uh, our state when it comes to that charging infrastructure you're looking at only being able to deploy about 1,328 DC fast charging stations all across the state. So um, with that being said, I'm hoping that, uh, you know, I've, I've kind of helped you all gain a little bit more of an interest when it comes to the cost to put this infrastructure into place um, and just identifying that there is sort of a, a difference between DC fast charging um, the different tiers inside the DC fast charging. So next time you approach a DC fast charging site, um, uh, maybe uh, maybe give a little more credit uh, to to the uh, actual owners uh, because they they have invested a substantial amount uh, of capital in that uh, in that site uh, for all things intended uh, electric car charging uh, purposes. So I'm Joseph, going to yep. Before you leave the the spreadsheet, uh, we had a question. Could you highlight the section where you're you're showing the cost of the the level two versus the one fifty versus the fifty? Which where where's the cost for each of those? So that's oh, right a, here. Uh, let me see. Right right there. So I'll put that in. So. It's, it's right here. Um, so that's level that. two and that's a DC fast charger. And then down that's below that. you do uh, 150 versus a 350, right? Is that what's going that's level so two versus That's correct. So for 150, it's $130,000 per port. And the level two, of course, stays the same. And then for uh, the 350, it's $215,000 per port. Yeah, and and the reason that you mentioned for this was was the the size of the cable. What what other concerns are there? Uh, the transformers, the utilities that have to come in that get involved in, uh, in in upgrading that site, transformer pads, um, the switch gears, everything is just intensified that much more. Um, and so when you're doing that and you multiply it times eight of all of that, um, it gets it gets up there. And so the 350 kW in particular. Um, it's a lot of strain on the utility company because the utility company um, has to put in their transformers. They have to put in, you know, add that that power load to their uh, their mix. And so um, they tend to charge people that are wanting to put that infrastructure in a little bit more uh, because of the things that they have to do on, on the back end. Uh, putting in eight charging stations, uh, 50 kW charging stations uh, for an inter for a utility company is probably not going to cost that much with regards to relative uh, upgrades that need to be done on site. Great, thank you. Awesome. Um, uh, I guess I can I can kind of leave the, the the screen shared, or we can get kind of get back to 
but um, yeah. Uh, yeah, go any, ahead and, and drop the screen sharing. Um, would yeah. you be willing to share that spreadsheet with the group somehow? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I can share. I can share it with you guys. And I mean, the overall asset, uh, the asset mix uh, was, you know, I, I sit on a few boards, uh, tech cetera, and um, and and basically help a lot of uh, people that aren't really dealing with this every day in and day out. Um, they, they wanted to know, well, if we have that $408 million from the federal government, how should we spend it and where should it go? And that's like, okay, well, let me put together something that kind of will help you guys, you know, kind of help you guys visualize this. Uh, but for the most part, it's important that from, from all the articles and stuff that, <clears throat> that we've read, um, you can't, again, you can't, you don't want to look at, um, the award side of things or putting in this infrastructure in the same light as you would, um, you know, a, another asset mix. You want to basically be able to put together a kind of a point system or a scoring system that allows the public to um, put this infrastructure in place over a course, uh, you know, kind of a steady course of time because the technology changes so fast. If you look at our pumps, our gas station pumps, our gas station pumps haven't changed. Uh, well, maybe maybe they have changed, you know, but over the years, it, it, essentially, it's still a pump and it's still, you know, um, but for the most part, like when it comes to this, this, this charging infrastructure, the electricity is everywhere. The amount of regulations that you have to, to do uh, to put in, in the infrastructure is not as 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 it is with a, a regular gas station. Um, and the char there are different levels uh, of uh, I mean, I don't I'm, <laughs> every gas station that, that you go to, it's got the same level of pump. You don't you don't pull up to a gas station. You have a fire hydrant. A hose that you can jump in and just fill your car up in two seconds and put you know there you don't do that right so it's nascar it's fuel filler versus the exactly there's no nascar fuel filler. yeah exactly so um we just have to kind of let 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 the public um it's more of an organic means of, of letting this happen um so that way the infrastructure can be in place um but at the same time there is a forced movement to where if you force people to put in infrastructure where um it's needed uh, you, you have low utilization rates. Uh, the stations are always, you know, broken. That's one of the big things right now is that there's so many uh, charging station companies. There's so many charging stations. They all have to be able to be on the same network and they all have to speak the same language. All their hardware has to talk with the software. And because there's so many companies so fragmented and not everybody's vertically stacked and integrated like that of Tesla, um, the controllability of that infrastructure that's in place uh, it, we, we've lost a lot of confidence in our public infrastructure. Um, and that's one of the things where uh, we're trying to get out there and, and regain everyone's confidence by making sure that we have, uh, our goal is to have a 98% uptime on all the charging stations that we monitor and we maintain uh, and service. And so, yeah, I, I wish that it could be like that for every uh, OEM, um, and, but unfortunately it's not. And um, it's one of the things that I, I really look forward to, to, to you know, tackling over the next five, 10 years uh, is just kind of reassuring and regaining everyone's confidence in that public infrastructure. So when they go and they do plan these trips, those charging stations are working. Absolutely, 1,000%. We did have one question earlier when you were talking about the, the, the how far behind we are as far as building out the infrastructure. So does that fall short um, number that you were talking about, does that account for what is happening with the Tesla side of things, or are you really thinking of them as two separate situations? No, I, th I think I think you have to include Tesla in, in that mix. I mean, Tesla right now, what we're seeing uh, controls uh, somewhere around, uh, you know, eighty-five to ninety percent of all all the EVs on the on the market, and so um, at least you know, being a, a full service, all inclusive electric car charging installation company. That's our, like our mix is that about 80, 80%, 85% of our business comes from uh, Tesla. They control that much of the marketplace and that's regarding home, commercial uh, and servicing uh, of their existing charging stations. So um, when I see that, you know, I don't know the mix, the, the actual mix here in Texas uh, of the amount of cars that are on the road that are Teslas as opposed to all the other electric vehicles. But I can pretty sure tell you that it's probably going to be somewhere around the 85, 90 percent of the EVs out there are Tesla. So this does include uh, Tesla's infrastructure as well. OK, um, I'm going to go ahead and try to unmute somebody. Matthew 
Weldon had a good question here about the kind of the mix of things. And so Matthew, I'm asking you to unmute if you'd like to ask your observation. Yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, no, my question was just about the you you uh, the comparison. Your basis of comparison was just uh, the price per port, and I just thought that a better comparison might be the uh, the number of charges, the unit charges per port, uh, so that you do credit the fast charger for the faster charging rate, uh, and that would of course make the the uh, the, the DC fast charging infrastructure look more economical i tend to agree with you even after that is done you're still going to want more i think you know a build out of a lot of l2s in a larger number of locations is a, is a better network but uh that was my question is just choosing the basis of comparison yeah i mean you know i, I wanted to go into that and then of course you have your recoup cost uh, or your return on investment uh you know what makes it enticing for a company to come in and put eight charging stations in per site um, with a $70,000 per port cost? I mean, you're, you're depending on what you charge the customer, um, you know, you, you, your rate of return is going to be, you know, millennia. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it, it seems like, um, you know, because you're having to pay for that electricity at the same time, you're upcharging the customer uh, and to try to make a small margin on top of that. And, you know, in theory, I didn't want to kind of get into the mathematics of, of the return on investment and, and rates uh, and, and the kind of business use case scenario on all things charging. Um, I wanted to leave, I just wanted to focus on like the cost of putting in that infrastructure. Um, there's different, you guys understand like when you go to some of these charging stations that they charge you like per time, they charge you per kilowatt. Uh, there's different flex billing and in, in what they're able to charge and, and and, and not charge. And so it all depends on like the, the business owner uh, that owns that site um, and what their, you know, kind of what their pricing model is. Uh, but rest assured with that type of cost to be able to put those stations in the ground, your return on investment is not going to be as lucrative or your payback period is not going to be as lucrative as uh, even, I would say, even a solar system. And so, um, you know, it's going to be, it's going to take some time for the, the, the companies that are investing in this technology um, to be able to, to recoup the cost of their investment. So if you look at, you know, uh, companies like Tesla or EVgo or Electrify America, EVgo is a, a little bit different than Electrify America. But if you look at EVgo, EVgo's main purpose is utilization of those charging stations. They are trying to get as many uses of that charging station, turns, 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 turns possible within a 24 hour period. Uh, and so they're looking at putting in that infrastructure in high utilization areas, more condensed, high traffic flow areas. Uh, whereas Electrify America, you know, because of the diesel gate thing and, and their, their kind of rollout and the way that that rollout is intended, they are just trying to blanket the, the US uh, with charging station infrastructure all over the map and try to put as many charging stations in the ground as possible. Um, and so just the EVgo is kind of more strategic in where they want to place. Um, and Electrify America is very strategic in where they want to place, but the, the business case use, Electrify America, they do care if those stations are, are used every day and, and day out, but it's not the top priority of why they put that infrastructure in place. They put that infrastructure in place to uh, be able to, you know, kind of create this nationwide network, uh, whereas EVgo is, is putting infrastructure in place in those areas strategically to try to capture a high utilization rate so they can recoup the cost um, and, and potentially make a, a good business case uh, scenario. I've, I've heard some real scary stories on some of the instances where EVgo is just not able to uh, have as high utilization rate in certain areas that they put that infrastructure in it as they wanted to. And it's, it's causing some concern on the investors on, on the back end uh, with regards to shareholders and so forth and so on. So, but I think if you're investing in, in a company like uh, EVgo or Electrify America or, or Tesla, I think you're in it for the long term. Uh, and not really for the short term gains. But yeah, that's why I, I wanted to focus on just the, the cost, the capital cost of putting that infrastructure on the ground and not so much uh, the rates and so forth and so on. Does that make sense? Yeah, that, you know, that that's that's a fine, fine reason to focus on it in that way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and I don't know how much you guys know about this. You know, I, I hope to bring something new to the table to maybe, you know, uh, perception wise uh, for us to 
to really kind of get a glimpse of, of this infrastructure and how costly it is. And if we have an opportunity uh, like the uh, Infra uh, Infrastructure Investment Act, um, then we should be able to, because it's so cost intensive, let's use that money um, in, in as smart of a way as possible to be able to put this infrastructure in because other than government help, it's going to take a long time for us to be able to build that infrastructure that we need because of the costs, uh, you know, that are involved in it. And that's all I wanted to do is just kind of share uh, that with you guys. So I'm going to ask uh, Mark Schillard to unmute. He had a good question about one about Smart Charge America, but then also related to the EVgo stuff going on or a conversation about what happened in South Padre as they were trying to build out infrastructure. Sure. Hey, Mark. Hey guys, um, yeah. So I, I used to I used to live in South Padre for uh, four years. Just moved back up to Central Texas, and um, and uh, while down there working for City Hall, we wanted to get we wanted to get uh, fast charging on the route from let's say I ten down to South Padre. There's only one DC fast charger on that route now, and it's at the Corpus dealer, or the Harley dealership in Corpus. Um, but I did have conversations with EVgo and Electrify America, and they both basically said the same thing. Um, you know, you're not a high density area. We, we're interested in Dallas and we're just interested in Houston. Um, my, my only, my, my best response to them has been, you know, yes, I, I totally understand that argument, but I'd love to, I'd love for them to, to care about the need for things like emergency egress. Um, uh, also you can't, I, I find it hard to promote EVs, uh, when there's no infrastructure down there. Uh, so uh, hopefully we'll, it, I, I, according to Electrify America's long-term uh, map, there's one that's going to be on the Robstown uh, Highway um, on the way down there. So fingers crossed for that. But uh, um, yeah, and the Electrify America, uh, the uh, Harley dealership uh, used to be free um, on that route, but now he's, uh, but now he charges. So just make that adjustment if you head that way. <laughs> Roger that. Awesome. Is he is he doing the uh, does he have the 50 kW systems at his dealership or is he doing the CPE 100s, which were the 25 kW system? No. Yeah. So there's a funny long story about that. I mean, when I bought my bolt in uh, July of last year, I I knew what I was getting myself into. I knew it was the only route down there. Mm -hmm. uh, it was free at the time uh, when I and I it, it was for it's 24 K uh, or yeah. it's, yeah, it's 24 kW. And, and I didn't you know brand new into evs didn't know any better i plugged in and i spent three hours um uh charging um and that's that was fine the first time of course now after being a, a year you know a year in i understand the difference well i understood what i figured out was that that thing was dropping down to 12 kilowatt i would start out at 19 it would quickly drop down to 12 or 11 and that's just not gonna work so we uh, worked with charge point to get it fixed and subsequently, he uh, I kept impressing upon uh, the owner of the dealership that you're the only route. You're the only route. And um, so now he charges 75 cents a minute. Wow. Yes. Wow. <laughs> yeah, supply and demand, that's scarcity. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean. We, so that's we, we one of the reasons people. that I really, I, and I've sent an email to you as well, but I really, I really want to. I, I was looking myself into buying buying land on that route and getting something a 50 kilowatt or 150 kilowatt on that route just because there is no other option at, at this point. So um, yeah, scarcity is definitely uh, an issue in South Texas and, and of course other places in, in the state but or in the country. Yeah, I mean, one of the other things is if you pull up to that station and it being the only one there and it's not working, um, you know, the dealership really doesn't, I mean, besides the monetization, um, but they probably have kind of a low utilization on that station. So if it does go down, um, you know, they have to kind of, well, if it goes down, it costs me, you know, 600 bucks to fix, uh, is that going to be worth my time? And then, you know, that whole return on investment thing on the repairs, like it's important that even though we're going to put in this infrastructure um, and, and hopefully we have those funds to do so, that we, we have to, we must earmark a certain percentage uh, of funds towards all things servicing uh, and, and you know, maintenance. And we have to make sure that we hold the, the station owners to that same degree. If we're gonna be giving them uh, or, or you know, administering federal funds 
uh, rebates, so forth and so on, they should be held to the highest standard with regards to making sure that that station is is always operational at Absolutely. all times. If not, then you either get penalized, you get fined, or you know you have a certain amount of you know you have 72 hours to get that charging station back up and running. So it's up to you, uh, business owner, to have uh, a company like Smart Charge America or a, a local electrician that knows these things. Uh, you know, in your back pocket, because if that bad boy goes down, you need to hurry up and get it fixed, or you, you, you'll pay fin- you'll pay penalties and fines. We need to really, you know, everyone, they, they, they talk about the infrastructure, they talk about the station, um, you know, allegates to the electric car, but no one, like everyone, I can promise you, no one thinks about service and maintenance of the current, you know, the infrastructure once it goes into place. And if you don't, you can really kind of get sideswiped uh, on that. And so, you always want to I always tell you like I always tell my clients, uh, look, if you bought an electric car, uh, you need a budget about three percent, three to five percent of the electric car's value to putting in that infrastructure. Um, and so I would say the same amount. You need a budget around three to five percent of, you know, the infrastructure that you put into the ground. You need to budget that same amount towards all things service and maintenance. One question uh, that came up earlier was, could you share a little bit about your relationship with ChargePoint and, and how you work with them? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So my char- my relationship with ChargePoint, I've been working with ChargePoint since 2000, oh, 2011. And uh, I'm a, a, a nationwide Premier Partner, uh, Premier Plus partnership. So that means, you know, we have to sell about a million dollars a year in, um, in ChargePoint systems. And so ChargePoint, they uh, have always been a, a little bit pricier, but so is Tesla. And, and ChargePoint is uh, very uh, like fully integrated and fully stacked as a charging you know company because they have their own network, they have their own software, they have their own charging stations. They have a certain amount of controllability when it comes to their charging stations. So, um, but they're not the only they're they're not, they're not the only game in town, right? So, similar to your pains on like comparing a Tesla to every other electric car uh, out there, you have some pros and cons, one of them being price um, and other, uh, other being, you know, kind of uh, an open source, you know, kind of network as opposed to a closed, fully integrated network. Um, well, ChargePoint kind of has the same thing. I like to call them fully integrated. Um, I don't like to call, call them a closed network because they're not. They do have the ability to kind of roam and inter, uh, interlock with other networks. It's just most of the time they choose not to because they're trying to protect um, you know their their market share and so as a result if you look at public infrastructure when it comes to charge point it's almost analogous to tesla and everyone else it's it's almost charge point and everyone else it's like uh, and so the wild wild west uh, really happens and is interesting in other cities like for instance city of austin and austin energy we have a majority of all public infrastructure under one umbrella, and that's ChargePoint. That's that's ChargePoint's, you know, Austin Energy's baby, ChargePoint. Um, while Charge Austin Energy can also open up their network to other platforms, and they have, um, they continue to, to focus uh, fully integrated on all things ChargePoint related. If you go to Portland or let's say Boston, it is the absolute wild, wild west. You have charge point you have tesla you have ev go you have just random charging stations with random networks um and if you're an ev driver it's uh it's tough uh it it really is so uh, i think austin energy knew that going forward they they made the move to create that partnership to make it easier on all the drivers here in town Um, but for the most part uh, our relationship with charge point is 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 a very is a very good one We, we take care of a lot of their charging uh servicing needs on all things public charging infrastructure in the 20 cities that we we service um, but mainly here in uh, in austin since we have the uh austin energy uh, utility service and maintenance contract under them under those guys so we have the ability to service way more charging stations that than charge point gives us but we also have uh contracts with blink um with tesla uh, and we we do our best to just kind of service as much of that char- charging infrastructure out there that we can. Uh, but we have, I mean, if you really want to look at our companies utilizing our services out there, 
um, they're only utilizing us about 40% of the capacity. We have the ability to be able to surface way more than what they're they're giving us. So it's my job to kind of get in front of them, stay in front of them and let them know, hey, we're always there for you guys. Use us as an asset out in the field. Please, 98% uptime. It's important that we keep these charging stations uh, operating at all, at, at, at all costs possible. So uh, charging station uh, relationship with ChargePoint is very good. Uh, very good. They are one of the the best. Now, we, we do... Um, we do look at you know, other entrants into the market like EV box, uh, wall box, uh, juice box uh, with Enel X. Um, and you, you, when you deal with those partners, you also have to deal with their system, their network, their software. Sometimes they don't even have their software. You have, they have other you know, software firms that they have to uh, dive down and, and use. And so it gets a little more fragmented, gets a little more complex to be able to put together um, you know, solutions for our customers with those guys. But if our customers come to us and they want that, or they want options, we absolutely don't hold back. We, we give them all the options as possible. So in a sense, I know it sounds cheesy and ironic, but we do give the customer the power to choose uh, by giving them multiple different options. So yes, it is cliche and uh, probably a horrible pun, but yeah, we do give our customers the power to choose when it comes to setting up all things infrastructure. Along those lines, about all of those different players out there, Derek, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, it seems like you're asking about whether or not there will be a standard at some point for how all of these charging networks couple, or, or is that what you're asking, Derek? Is Derek there? Uh, you know, no. I mean... He took, uh, he, you know, he, he looked at our, our, our relationship with with uh, ChargePoint, but, um, you know, we do have the the, the ISO uh, 15118 uh, protocol, which is the plug and charge protocol. So I can see um, manufacturers kind of leaning towards that. But again, that type of protocol, it's going to take about five to 10 years to roll out to where it becomes nationwide and everyone's using it. And yes, that is the simplest, easiest protocol because uh, you have just, you know, you just plug it in and it's almost like the supercharger network where the car knows who you are, cars identified, everything's connected. There's no means of, of, you know, having a credit card swipe or RFID card or anything that you just plug in. I mean, that is definitely where we need to be looking towards. Um, and when we, when we do that, then you don't have to worry about, um, you know, a card or an activation, all that stuff. Everything is kind of done on, you know, kind of on, on, under one umbrella uh, where, where or how long that takes it's it's going to be a race to the finish but you know that that is one of the pains in other deregulated markets when you go into that infrastructure um, on the amount of, of subscriptions apps cards rfid cards uh access that you have to have uh it's it's getting it's getting redundant it's getting very bad in some areas and it's only going to get worse unless you have a single solution uh there for now uh, if Tesla decides to open up their charging network, um, my, I've, I've always told people <laughs> that uh, it'd probably be a good idea to have two charging ports on your car, one of like Tesla and one of Universal, um, or um, one of like Universal and one that's just like kind of this new charging standard that everyone uses, including Tesla. Uh, and so, um, if, if we do change over uh, when it comes to like the CCS, Chatamo, and J1772, if we do change over to one charging port um, type, it's going to require for some time that, that we put that infrastructure in and that electric cars are manufactured with two, two, two charging ports, uh, one being a, a universal and then the other being that specific type, J1772, Chatamo, SS, you know, CCS, that sort of thing if we decide to go in that direction, but there hasn't been any talks uh, of us going in that direction at all, um, using one charging standard across the board for every electric vehicle out there. Uh, yeah, so. the, the question was really meant a little bit different. Uh, I've always liked the idea of driving up and letting the car plug itself in to robotically. Yeah, I can, mm -hmm. a, yeah absolutely. I mean, I'm working on a patent right now. It's called ARC charging, um, autonomous rendezvous dock charging. Um, similar to how the space station connects with the, uh, uh, the, the Dragon, um, how they use uh, autonomous means to, to couple that in. I basically am, am working on a patent right now uh, that allows um, the charging station to basically be put into place or flex a little bit and have that electric, you know, uh, autonomous vehicle plug in 
because if you think about it, you can't really have full autonomous driving without uh, wireless or autonomous charging means. Um, and being able to have the uh, the port, you know, kind of isolated, hooked up to a, 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 a electrical source that's, you know, kind of fixed, uh, you'd be able to shove in a large amount of power uh, as fast as possible, as opposed to wireless charging for now. Um, so uh, when it comes to all things uh, autonomous vehicles, we are working on wireless charging technology to where, um, or uh, kind of coupling technology to where, um, but it's mainly made for, um, Kind of semi trucks. Uh, basically, what we're trying to develop is some uh, a means of when that truck loads back into the loading dock, it, it autonomously connects with a charging platform that's basically distributed on an entire uh, row, uh, you know, on the on the bays of, of those loading docks. And when that that truck pulls in, uh, they're charging while people are unloading that truck. And by the time that truck is finished unloading, that truck is already fully charged and it's autonomously going to the next site where they're backing up, they're getting loaded. When the truck's being loaded, um, then it's also being charged at the same time. And so the truck drivers aren't really having to stop in the middle of their route to go get another charge. They're literally doing it at the same time that they're experiencing the downtime on the unload and reload part of it. And so we can put that into practice on things uh, such as the high mileage vehicles, taxis, uh, autonomous you know, vehicles, so, so forth and so on. But it's, it's uh, again, it's the, it's having a, a means of standardizing that charging, that coupling means uh, to be able to do so. That's kind of the hard part. But we've seen some some automated arms where the car is parked and there's an automated arm that comes and just kind of grabs and puts in place and charges and then releases and you know kind of goes that way. I think that's probably going to be uh, one of the more common methods of uh, autonomous robot charging uh, for. But you know, the, the car is going to have to be parked a certain way in a certain position with the robotics and all that stuff. And if you think charging infrastructure is hard to repair now, go ahead and throw uh, autonomous uh, uh, atomatronics or uh, automation when it comes to robotics in there and see how fast those things get, uh, um, you know, back on the market after something goes wrong with them. So it's, it's going to be a fun and interesting journey over the next 10, 20 years, needless to say. But yeah, I mean, we're already kind of adopting and adapting towards all things wireless charging. I mean, you can't really have uh, full autonomous driving without wireless charging. If there's a human element to it, um, it's not really fully autonomous. And so uh, in, in our opinion, um, to have the high mileage drive, you know, Tesla network and ca taxis and all of that good stuff, you need that wireless charging or no human intervention charging aspect to it, regardless of wireless or coupling, so forth and so on. But the arc charging is something that we're working on, and that's just autonomous rendezvous dockless charging um, that, uh, you know, hopefully we can we can kind of spear, uh, spearhead, maybe get some funding for it and kind of go from there. But that's definitely one of our passions. Great. Thank you, Joseph. I'm going to go ahead and say that we're uh, five minutes out from, from the hour, so I'm going to Close us down. So, thanks a lot. I appreciate your time. I really appreciate your um, support for um, Drive Electric Week and then also for Austin EV over the years. So, um, yeah, we'll be here without you, Aaron. I mean, you do more for the community. You do more for here in us in Austin that that uh, quite frankly, we you would we would never be able to show you enough appreciation uh, for that, man, and, and for all the hard work that you've been doing and that you will continue to do for the rest of this week <laughs> on putting these presentations together. It's a lot, it's it's a lot of planning, it's a lot of being there and making it happen. And it's also a lot of follow through afterwards. And so you play a big part of that. So uh, no, my thanks goes off to you uh, uh, through and through, man. But I, I appreciate everyone's time uh, and, and, and allowing me the, the time to kind of talk and, and basically share our passion um, and, and what we're out there trying to fight for um, in, in, in regards to public infrastructure out there. So I appreciate everyone's time and thank you enough. Uh, can't thank you enough, Aaron. I appreciate it. Thank you. And for everybody else, so we, this is the first in several sessions. So if you um, go to austinev.org, you'll find the list of all of the sessions for the remainder of the week. And then you'll also identify there the opportunity to join the national organization, which uh, supports us in a variety of ways. So um, please check that out.